So, well, it's, uh, I, don't, I think that Urs doesn't need a presentation, but we are also very lucky because he's staying with us for a month. So, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure. So, go on. <laughs> it's also a great pleasure for me. And actually, I have to apologize for not having to be introduced anymore. It means that I've been speaking too much already. But uh, <laughs> thanks for still bearing with me. So, now comes uh, the second part of the conference, and that will be about physics. I will um, talk a bit of physics and a bit of mathematics now. It might get a bit more technical, but I'm trying to give a, um, an exposition. So the punchline that I'm going to make is uh, that you know, now that mathematicians, since maybe four or five years, have finally realized that one should better distinguish uh, things that you know, better keep track of objects being equivalent without necessarily being uh, identified, I, I would like to make the point that this is an insight that fundamental physicists have made in the middle of the 20th century, almost 70 years back already. Of course, the way they talk, it's hard for mathematicians and also for physicists themselves to keep track of what they actually know and what they forget. But if you look at what they should have written down by the mathematicians, they would have written this down 70 years ago. And uh, this will be a bit my story today. I'll talk about how the gauge principle in quantum field theory is really, it's really pretty much the homotopical logic that uh, Eric Finster just presented. And um, I will come to the actual homotopical logic at the very end, and first we'll do some, some, something more reportedly, more sticky, that will connect to the talk by Mathieu and Eric in the morning. So, this is a fact that it's experimentally kind of established. The world is governed by quantum field theory. But actually there are qualifiers to this, which are important to keep in mind. I mean, first of all, it's local quantum field theory. This will play an important role in my talk. My talk will be about two principles, the locality principle and the gauge principle. It's local quantum gauge field theory. And actually, but this will not be the topic of today, it's Lagrangian quantum gauge field theory, whatever that means. This is not the topic of today. The topic of today is the combination of these two aspects, the locality principle and the gauge principle in quantum field theory. And this is what I will recall and explain. So you don't need to know any quantum field theory or to follow this talk. Here's a well-kept secret, something that has been true for, you know, known for 70 years, but you don't see the textbooks highlighted. It's the following thing. If you combine the locality, and this I will explain in the following slides. If you combine the locality principle of quantum field theory, whatever that is, with what physicists nowadays sometimes lazily call gauge redundancy, but which is not actually redundancy, and we'll look into this, which should better be called as what it was when it was introduced, gauge equivalences, and the word equivalence there, you know, the gauge is just jargon, the word equivalence is going to be just the way, just the notion of equivalence, of univalent equivalence that we, we saw in the previous talk, that this combination is, let's, let's maybe call it the gauge principle to make it be more symmetric, the, the locality <laughs> principle combined with the gauge principle is, is what in mathematics is known as the stack principle, the, the stack condition, I will, this will be what, this is what my talk will be about. And uh, another way, so stack is a historically grown term that I think, as most mathematical terms, is entirely unsuggestive of what it actually denotes. Maybe a different way of saying it is that this is the concept of higher geometry, where higher means, again, homotopical. So the goal of today is to reveal that well-kept secret. By example, I will demonstrate how gauge fields form smooth group points and smooth stacks. And at the very end, I'll indicate on the very last slide the formalization of this is homotopy type theory, and cohesive homotopy type theory that has been alluded to before, and I think that David Caulfield will um, talk about a bit more in the following talk. So 90% of my talk about is just exposing this point of view that homotopical geometry has been present for a long time already. So it's kind of a quasi definition, meta definition. So what do physicists mean when they say a field is local? So a field, you should think of the fields we should think of is like the electromagnetic field filling this room, showing us how the light is distributed and you know the, the electronics is distributed. Might be more exotic fields that you've heard of from the media, the Higgs field or some other fields, but it's good for everything that I'm going to, to say to mostly think of, say, the electromagnetic field in this room. So when do we say that such a field is local? Well, it's an obvious condition. It means that if I, feel, if I have a field conversion on a large space time, say in this whole room, then it must be true that this field configuration is equivalently recovered by the local field configurations, say in the left half and the right half of the room, such that they are identified on the overlap. So we don't want that globally funny things happen, that some global field configurations exist that cannot be rebuilt by the local pieces. That's one way of stating the locality principle in physics. Here's a simple example. 
the simplest, mathematically simplest example, even though physically this is a bit exotic, until, until when was it, last year, this was a hypothetical example, last year a scalar particle was actually formed, so you might think of the Higgs field here, so when physicists say they have a, a scalar field, like the Higgs field, then that means that on a space-time x, x will always be my spaces, there is a function, a field conversion will be a function to the real numbers or to the, to the complex numbers or something slightly more sophisticated, but essentially just such a function. And the locality principle just means the following now. If you have a chart of x by open subset zi, so this is my running notation, so we always have spaces x that are covered by open subsets zi, and uh, we take them all together to form a, a chart of x. So then, if we have such a global field, we may be restricted to each of these patches to get functions on the UI. And of course, being restricted this way, they will identify these local restrictions on the double intersections, UI cap, UJ of these charts. So if you're in the left half of the room, if you're in the right half of the room, and the intersection would coincide. So the locality principle here is that these local VI, together with these identifications on the double intersections, are equivalent to the globally defined functions. So this is a trivial statement that uh, nevertheless serves as, the, as, a, as a good starting point for what we're talking about. So in master argument, this just means that we have this sheaf of functions, our underline usually, which is physically the fields of the sheaf of scalar fields on patches of U, which mathematically is just this sheaf of smooth functions. And uh, yeah, a priori, the fact that you have this assignment on local spaces and the restrictions to local spaces is what makes it a pre-sheaf, and that locality principle is mathematically the sheaf condition. Precisely what it is. So, so let's, let's look at a, at a very similar example, but um, this is good for what follows. So, so this is not the, the true story, but back in the 19th century, Maxwell explained that the electro electromagnetic field is a local field in a very similar way. So he noticed in modern language that the electromagnetic field strength encoded in what's known as the Faraday tensor is a uh, modern language just a closed differential two form F on our space-time, and just as before with our scalar fields, it's no longer a real valid function, but a two-form, but the story is the same. We may go and restrict such a two-form to each of these patches to get local two-forms, and on double overlaps, they will intersect, they will uh, be identified, and again, the locality principle says that such a bunch of local two-forms equipped with identifications or where their supports intersect are equivalent to the globally defined two forms. In mass targeting, it's just the same thing again. We have now the sheaf of closed two forms. It starts out being a pre-sheaf, and the, this gluing condition is the sheaf condition. So this example, of course, the Iraq notice in the 1930s is not the end of the story, that there's more going on. This will concern us now. Here's another example that I want to mention for those of you who have seen a bit more of mathematical physics. You know, the sophisticated mathematical physics textbooks will go and say, what is a field? They will say, well, a field on a space X is defined by a field bundle, which is some vector bundle, um, gamma over X, and then such that the field configurations are the sections of that bundle. For what I'm talking about today, one should just be careful that this is what physicists would call maybe a non-covariant version of a field. This encodes field configurations on that fixed manifold X. So being a sheaf of sections, there will be a locality principle on the fixed X but no locality principle if we also let x vary, as we would, for instance, in general relativity, where x is space-time that is not fixed a priori. So there's two concepts, maybe, of locality. And um, what I was just to want to highlight here also, as I did in my lecture on, on Monday, is that what the textbooks, like most of them, not all of them, but most of them will highlight is this left part. They will look at sheaves on a fixed topological space. Whereas what's important here is that we look at sheaves on the category of all manifolds, we let x vary in a covariant manner. We might call this covariant locality. And um, this is, you know, mathematically, technically, it's still the same concept of sheaf on a site, but I just want to highlight this fact that conceptually it plays a very different role. So in mass starting, we would distinguish by saying on the right side, we're considering the gros topos on the side of manifolds instead of the petit topos on a fixed manifold, just to keep this point in mind. So this was the locality principle, and now we come to the gauge principle. And remember, the goal of the talk is to combine these two and show what results. So what is the gauge principle in physics? It means that we change the notion of identification. Remember, the locality principle was important that we said we have local field configurations equipped with identifications and overlaps. That was okay for scalar fields, because if you think about it, if you have two scalar fields to real-value functions, there's really no other way. Either they're not equal or they're equal. 
So if, if we have a phi 1 and a phi 2, kind of two you know, <laughs> terms of this world, if you wish, terms of type scalar field, then they're equal or not. But for gauge fields, this is no longer the case. So these A1, maybe I should write this here. I haven't written this. So such a gauge field, A, is a, is a one form, not closed, on the given base space. This is called, when physics textbook, the electromagnetic potential, the vector potential of the electromagnetic field. It's such that the Durham differential of it is the Faraday tensor we saw before. Maybe the slide should have shown this. Anyway, the point is, this was the big insight, first half of the 20th century, that if you have two such gauge field configurations, A, such vector potentials, they may be gauge equivalent without actually being equal. So they may be, the way physicists like to speak is they, they are physically indistinguishable, but still they're different. So we could write this twiddle sign coming from the notation for equivalence relation to denote that there might be a gauge field A1, which is different from a gauge field A2, but they're gauge equivalent. But in fact, it turns out what for the physics actually matter is the choice of identification. This is speak of gauge transformations when they have a group valued function. Let's just think of a real valued function G here. So I should maybe write this down on the board. So the G on this board would be a real valued function, say, or in general, a smooth function with values in the gauge group if our or forms take values in the Lie algebra of that gauge group. And we would say the gauge potential A1 is identified with, under the gauge transformation as A2 if you know it satisfies some relation to these Gs. For it being a G, that will just mean that, that A2 is, uh, is A1 plus DG plus the Durand differential. So, so in mass talking, of course, remembering choice of gauge equivalences means that we refine the equivalence relation where we just remember that two things are equivalent to group points, the way that Mathieu very nicely explained this morning, where we remember this actual G that makes them equivalent. So, so to emphasize this here, again, what I just said, so take chart Rn, so a Euclidean space inside our space sum x, a coordinate chart if you wish, and let's look at the gauge equivalence relations of the gauge fields on Rn. So, yeah, finally, I have it on the board here. So, our gauge field is a one form on Rn with values in the Lie algebra. And, um, and a priori, we might think if we just say, well, let's just identify these things, if they're gauge equivalent, then we say, let there be a gauge equivalence relation between A1 and A2 whenever a gauge transformation exists. Which means, again, mathematically, that there's this formula. Right? And this, gauge, this will be actually an equivalence relation, so it will have transitivity in it. And that is just, the transitivity is just inherited from the fact that the gauge transformations may be combined. So if A1 is gauge equivalent to A2 via some G that exists, and A2 to A3 via some H, then A1 will be gauge equivalent to A3 via the combined gauge transformation. But as we just saw, we should remember, we should take these twiddly equivalence relation lines and replace them by actual morphisms that remember that are morphisms in a group body and that remember the actual gauge transformations. So what we will actually want to do is we will want to assign to each Rn the groupoid of gauge fields on that chart. Those objects are again these one forms whose morphisms are these gauge transformations. And now there's this actual composition of gauge transformation. And of course the inverses this really forms the groupoid. So now comes the, the key point of the talk. We had, have seen two principles. Now the, the locality principle that said global fields should be equivalent to a bunch of local fields equipped with identifications and overlaps. And we have seen that the gauge principle says that the notion of identification changes. Identification should be by gauge transformations. So we now combine this. What does this mean? So suppose we have our x again covered by the ui. On each local chart, we have a gauge field, ai, as we had before. On ui. These are the local field configurations. But now I'm supposed to identify them where they overlap. So on the overlaps of two charts, I'm supposed to identify them in this refined notion of gauge equivalence. So I'm supposed to choose a gauge equivalence between these two field configurations restricted to the double intersection. Not just assert that there is one, I have to choose one. So as, as we go from the field configuration A1 on U, AI on UI to that, to uh, you know, the field configuration AJ on UJ, we maybe label that gauge transformation if we choose GIJ. But then to do this consistently, we should, on triple intersections, mimic the situation we had on the previous slides. We should say, 
Well, if I identify AI on UI via GIJ with AJ, identify furthermore AJ with AK via some GJK, then that total composite identification between AI and AK should be the chosen one that I've chosen the double overlap between UI and UK. If you work, if you write output, so this is a picture of that group point of gauge transformations, where the composition of, of these gauge transformations is just the pointwise multiplication of these group value functions that these little g's are. So if you work out what, what the fact means that this diagram commutes in the group point, it just means that you have this equation between functions on these triple overlaps, gij times gjk equals gik, is an equation between group value functions, and that is the famous cocycle condition. A cocycle of the form that Mathieu mentioned would be uh, the kind of thing that the language of stacks helps us to phrase in terms of direct maps, and that's in fact what we do in the next slides. So, so this is how local gauge fields actually work. A gauge field configuration, let me just reiterate this again, combining the locality principle and the gauge field principle, a gauge field configuration on a big space time is a bunch of local gauge field, uh, gauge, gauge field configurations equipped with choices of equivalences on where they overlap. So let's build some interesting examples from this. This was noticed 1931, I think, by Paul Dirac. It was the first time that somebody added something new to Maxwell's equations. He, he observes the following. Suppose you have a space-time outside of a magnetic monopole. So you suppose at some point in space there's a magnetic monopole sitting. He took that point out at this origin of R3 there. And, um, and um, you know, topologically, the remaining space is just a sphere times, times something else, since we're just since I'm currently not talking about you know, metrics or anything, and just interested in topology, we can just as well just think of the resulting space image just being the sphere around this magnetic monopole, with you know, time and the remaining space dimension being ignored for just presentational purposes. So then, what is a gauge field configuration on that space time around that magnetic monopole? Well, we have seen the prescription for how to build gauge field configurations on the previous slides. Here's what we have to do. We have to choose a cover of that sphere. Well, an easy choice, and it turns out to be sufficient, that's some theorem I should prove, but let's just assume it. We can cover it just by, by two Hamite spheres. So here's our sphere, and we cover it just by the, the southern hemisphere that overlaps the equator just a little bit, and by the northern hemisphere that overlaps the equator just a little bit, called S plus and S minus. Then to define a global gauge field configuration, we have to choose local gauge field configurations, one here, and A plus on this hemisphere, and A minus on this hemisphere, and on the, on the equator where they overlap, I have to choose a gauge transformation between them, G. So that equator can be thought of as being arbitrarily thin. It's effectively just a circle. So the gauge transformation will be a G-valued function. The gauge group G here for the electromagnetic field would be the circle group U1. So this gauge transformation, this choice of gauge transformation that I have to make to glue these two field configurations together is just a, a U1-valued map on the circle. And now I haven't described the group part of global gauge fields yet, but if you work it out, you find that in the group point that all these global gauge transformations of which we have constructed one year forms, one such will now be equivalent to the winding number of this gauge transformation G regardless map from the circuit to itself. That's what the physicists call the monopole number, the charge of this magnetic party that it be enclosed. It happens to be also the integral over the S2 of the, of the Faraday tensor and physicists would also call it the magnetic charge, the magnetic flux through that sphere. In mass jargon, what we did is just the what's called the clutching construction that exhibits the first Chern class by Czech cycle. That's just some jargon. Let's look at one more example, which is sort of the same kind of example, just to see how this really does appear in physics, that this is something that you can experimentally test. Here's the young Mills in Santon, discovered maybe 20 years after, you know, written down maybe 20 years or 30 years, I don't know, after Dirac. Same kind of story, now we think of an SU2, so that's the gauge group of the nuclear, weak nuclear force, an SU2 gauge field, um, so, so locally given by one form, so there's in the Lie algebra of SU2, on, on the one point compactification of R4, so we think of doing an accelerator experiment sort of at CERN, and we approximate CERN by, you know, we approximate Geneva or something by R4, but we say, it, you know, what happens at infinity, we should ignore, field should manage at infinity, so mathematically that means one considers the one-point compactification of R4, so that we consider fields that vanish at infinity, so homotopic, you know, topologically it means we consider fields on S4, the one-point compactification S4. And now we want to construct an SU2 gauge 
configuration on that space time. And it's the same story as before. We may cover, this is something you need to prove, but it happens to be okay. So we may cover again the four sphere by two hemi three spheres, S plus and S minus. Choose local gauge field configurations, A plus and S minus, just as before. The gauge field measures, the equator is now a little thickened three sphere, and uh, the gauge field measures map to SU2 on that three sphere. Again, one finds the equivalence class, these global field conversions given by the so SU2 again looks like S3, so the, you have maps from S3 to themselves. So again, there they turn out to be measured by the winding number of this map, which is now called the instantal number for historical reasons, uh, which is also expressed by this integral expression. In mass drawing, again, what we did is just what we call the clutching construction of for the second Chern class of an SU2 principal bond. So these are just two examples that show you how from this prescription to build global gauge fields by using local gauge fields and gluing the gauge transformations, we get these very non-trivial structures where, you know, the point is that all the non-triviality is in the gauge transformation. This instantal number is the winding number of this gauge transformation. This gauge transformation is what sees this, this characteristic class. Without that gauge transformation, if you would take this to be an identity, you would always see just a trivial class. You would see no instantals. Yeah, I should see this on the next slide. I should just show the next slide. So, punchline, what did we just show? Yeah, I'm just repeating myself, the choice of gauge transformation crucially matters. So what I've kind of shown is that if you combine the gauge principle with just gauge relations, if you forget the choices of gauge transformations, there will be no monopoles. N monopole would be zero because the winding number for trivial gauge transformation is zero. Whereas if you do consider the full gauge group point for the locality principle, you get all magnetic monopole configurations. Similarly, if you combine the locality principle with just gauge relations for it, say SU2, weak nuclear force fields, then you find no instanton configurations, while if you do keep the gauge group point with its full information and take it into account, you do find all the instanton sectors, as it's called. And this methods for the following reason, this is kind of an experimental fact. There are instantons in nature. This is deduced experimentally by, you know, well, by all the standard model for the baryogenesis, the way that, you know, the way that the reason why there's more matter than antimatter in this universe comes from something called the chiral anomaly, whose anomaly term is precisely that instanton number. So if, if these instantons were not there, there would be no, you know, there would be no matter over antimatter. Also, more subtle phenomena in what's called the QCD vacuum require these instantons related to the theta angle. And there is locality from the simple fact that if you take the Lagrangian, well, I haven't explained this, but if you take the standard model of particle physics, the thing that people get excited about when they find the Higgs particle. It's a local Lagrangian that describes a local field theory. So if you take these two things together, it follows, logically, that the physical world follows homotopical logic in the sense that we're not allowed to identify things that might be related just by equivalence relations. Let's make this, let's, let's draw, draw a conclusion from this to come to the actual stacks. So what we, sh what we should do when we, when, we consider, when we consider the collection of global gauge fields, is that we should say to a space-time x, we assign not just the group point of globally defined one forms and the gauge transformations on that space-time, but we assign the group point of our gauge fields in all of these topological sectors that, that we build by, by gluing local fields along non trivial gauge transformations. And one can check that this assignment to space times of this group point of gauge fields in non-trivial topological sectors, with non-trivial instantal sectors, that this is covariantly local in the right sense. In the, in the, in the right senses, in mass jargon, this is a stack, a higher sheaf of group points. Meaning, if you consider that as the correct global gauge fields, then these are recovered up to equivalence from local fields with gauge transformation. Whereas the naive assignment to a space time x assign just the group of gauge fields in the topologically trivial sector, so just the globally defined A's, this will not be covariantly local. And our two examples have shown this. A global field configuration in that case would always be just a global one form, whereas we've seen that if you glue it from local data, you will get more. So in mass dragon, this naive choice where you forget the gauge transformations is just a pre-stack, meaning it doesn't satisfy the locality principle, but also you know, while, while you might say, and while I'm arguing that this is a bad thing to consider, actually, math also offers you a way to use that to present the top guy. There's some, given any pre-stack, there's some universal way of completing it 
restoring the locality principle, which is what mathematicians would call stackification. So some more jargon. So, so while this is called stacks, I think that neither of the words stack or sheaf of group points, or as some people say, category five by the group points of a manifold, nothing of this great terminology. I want to propose a different terminology. So the first one is unsuggestive. Stack is really a bad word. This is certainly too long. This is both. So, so for formulating physics, it's useful to change perspective a bit. I already said this in detail in my lecture last week. I'll say it very briefly now again. We will go and think of these stacks on the gross side of all manifolds as being smooth sets with refined gauge equivalence relations. Let's just look at what I mean. I mean this. Here's smooth sets. That was the first part of my lecture last week. So think of an arbitrary sheaf, an arbitrary assignment to patches of manifolds u, of sets x of u, as sending any manifold u as a rule that, that sends any manifold u to what is going to be the set of smooth maps from u into some x. The space of maps from u to x. Only that this x hasn't been defined yet. That is our rule. We are defining a would be sorry, a would be space x by how we would map smooth manifolds into it. But the collection of these rules we will take to be the smooth the definition of the smooth space. And uh, one of the, the standard facts of category theory says that this is actually a consistent way of going about it. The Yoneda lemma says that this is consistent. Smooth manifolds do faithfully embed into such rules that define smooth set, sets. And indeed, the Yoneda lemma says that we may remove, after this inclusion, the quotation marks here. If you consider, consider maps of such rules defining smooth sets between a smooth manifold and such a would-be space X, you do recover the set that we predefined to be the set of maps from u to x. So the point of view here is that the point is that if you consider a sheaf on the gross side of all smooth manifolds, there is a good generalization of the concept of smooth manifolds. It's a set equipped with smooth structure in some generalized sense. And uh, what I'm trying to advertise now on the, on the next slide is that this is the perspective in which we best in physics think of these stacks of gauge fields. So let's do the same thing. Yeah, so we do for all my sources. Let's do the same thing now with the, with the gauge field summation taken into account. The same slide as before, only that it has group points now everywhere where we had sets before. But let me just say it anyway again, to just to repeat. So an arbitrary stack on smooth manifolds, so an assignment to each manifold U. And again, we take all the manifolds of a group point XU, which you should think of as being the group point of gauge fields on that U. Think of this as a rule that where this group point is, the group point of maps from u into a would be, would be smooth group point, which we call x. That's the generalization of the Yoneda lemma, the two Yoneda lemma, or maybe two comma one Yoneda lemma, which says that again, this is consistent. Smooth manifolds will again faithfully embed into smooth group points, which are things defined by such rules, which are just stacks on the gross side of all manifolds. And if under the embedding we map a smooth manifold into such a smooth group point, we will get precisely the smooth group point that defined x in the first place. So it's a bit of a, how did you call it, a Münchhausen trick to, to say what is, a smooth, what is a smooth generalized space by defining what it would mean to map into it out of a smooth manifold. And then you notice that a consistent rule of such assignments actually defines that thing as a good smooth set. But is it okay that smooth maps between manifolds are just a set? Maybe okay. Yeah, because sets are special kinds of group points. Yeah. So this happens to be you know, two common multiples on one side. It happens, they, one could consider more general things, but yeah, it's okay. So, so here's where maybe a bit of research begins, and now we're in, in the last 5% maybe of the talk, so I'll, I'll just state this. So you can consider this category of all smooth sets as a replacement for a category of smooth manifolds. And there's an excellent context for doing differential geometry and physics, I claim. And moreover, you can take this full category or two category of smooth group points, and it turns out to be an excellent context for doing high differential geometry of gauge fields. And here, excellent has a precise meaning, which I will not, uh, you know, get much into it. But uh, it's it's this thing that I that Levere actually called cohesive topos theory. So, so this category satisfies some property that uh, makes us want to say they are cohesive. And as soon as they're cohesive, it turns out we can do essentially everything that we ever wanted to do in terms of differential geometry and physics in these things. In particular, let's write BG con for the smooth group of gauge fields. So you know what's going on now is we take BG con as the name for that thing which sends a 
a manifold U to the group point of global, I mean of correct, G gauge fields, fields on U, the way we discussed in some detail. By the previous slides, this whole assignment now I may regard as one single smooth group point. Aspects of this were mentioned in the previous talks by Mathieu and maybe also by, by Eric. So what we can do now, in the category of smooth group points, we take a manifold, any manifold, we got a smooth group point, and we consider maps directly into this. And this is how, th these will be these cosines that Mathieu mentioned. So these, these maps, let's call them nabla, they will be the gauge fields on X. So what we have built in this, by going to this excellent context, of smooth group points of geometric homotopy types, we build a context where gauge fields on manifolds have a, what's called a modulized stack, a, a refined classifying space. So if it maps into this space are gauge fields, let's write it like this actually. And that if you have two such maps and hence two such gauge fields that are homotopy between such maps, it's precisely gauge transformation between these gauge fields. So this allows us to do lots of nice things, which which is the topic maybe of another talk, maybe of tomorrow's lecture, actually. So let me just end this talk by, by saying one could ask now, given that we saw that physics sort of recovers or knew already about many concepts that turn out not to be crucial to this new homotopy type theory that we just saw in Eric's talk, you can ask, well, can we formalize this kind of construction now in homotopy type theory? Say, if, if we want to bring computer scientists into the game and have them prove something about you know, magnetic monopoles and young mills and sometimes then there's now a real, real chance that if we could formalize these things that they might reason about the QCD vacuum eventually. <laughs> so let's, let's take this as an art of. So recall the previous talk by Eric Finster about homotopy type theory. So this plain homotopy type theory that was on the board does now about modular types BG of instant on sectors. So, so. So there's this forgetful map from this stack BG con to the stack that is called just BG, which, which forgets, forgets, forgets these one forms AI and simply assigns the, the underlying G principle abundance encoded just by the transition functions GIJ. So this type, these types may be axiomatized in homotopy type theory, namely simply they are pointed connected types, meaning they do have a term, and that term is unique up to equivalence. Connectedness is something that was one of the initial insights of Evrotsky. And connectedness is distinct, something one may formalize in terms of homotopy type theory. Now, however, the instant from sectors alone are, of course, not very interesting. We really need these modular sex of the gauge fields. Now, plain hot is consistent, but ignorant. Consistent with, but ignorant about these BG coordinates. What I mean by this is that homotopy type theory does have models in infinity topos, you know, in contexts where these BG cons exist. But the plain language of homotopy type theory has no means to, to speak about them, to characterize them, or to notice that some type is of this form, whereas it does have the means to notice that some type is of this form. This was mentioned very briefly, I think, by Eric at the end of his talk. One needs an extra axiom to, to capture this genuinely geometric information. And uh, the idea is to add an axiom to hot. I mean, this has been made precise, but the, uh, I'm not going to give the precise definition. So the idea is to add an axiom to hot that ensures, this is how to think about it, that ensures that for every type x in there, for every smooth group point, there's another one, the shape of x, which, has the which is supposed to have the interpretation of being the, the type of geometric paths in x, not the, not the plane paths that exist in homotopy type theory that are just gauge equivalents, but actual geometric paths in the sense of Actual trajectories, you know, this is a type X here, space. We're talking about actual trajectories, smooth trajectories that a particle might trace out in such a space. Actually, smooth maps, say, from a real line. In so, so one may, one may add such a construction. It gives a modality on the type system shape and, you know, add a bunch of axioms to it to ensure that it behaves the way that this idea suggests it should behave. And then, almost the type equipped with that modality is called cohesive homotopy type theory. So this is something I did with Mike Schulman. And I think a little bit more about the maybe philosophical implications of this will be in the following talk by David Corfield. So if we do add that axiom, then we do 
are able to exponentialize these things as follows. First of all, if I have a direct function between this shape type of x into bg, then this, these functions have now the interpretation of flat connections. And the way this works is by parallel transport, for those who have ever seen these things. So if we take the shape of x, which you should, another simple is, but it collides with a dependent product, that's why I'm not writing it, you should think of it as being the path infinity group point of x. If a map from that to just bg, that is the same thing as a flat connection, it turns out. I mean, this is the interpretation of flat connection, because you think of this guy, so this is passing, so this has as objects kind of the points x, y, z in x, but as morphisms, it has geometric paths between, geometric paths between these points. So as we have such morphism to BG, you know, BG looks like it has locally, it has a single point, and, and the morphisms are these G-valued elements, which are the gauge transformations. So such a core cycle, let's just send each point locally to the single point here, and each path gamma here to, to a group element associated with this path. And this group element, one we think of being the, the parallel transform, the transport that a G connection would assign to such a path. But it has to be a flat one, because this being an affinity group point, you know, if this really is a, is a diagram here in the group point, there will be a two cell fitting it. So it means that if I, if I go, uh, you know, go along two paths and, and along this path, so there's a surface in between them, then there must be a homotopy between this parallel transport and this parallel transport, which is the flatness condition of uh, I mean, this is maybe lots of jargon, but for those who have seen it, just the basic course of differential geometry will maybe recognize how this works. So this is the parallel transport of Nabla. It is in this way that functions of the shape type into BG encode flat connections. But now we wanted all connections, not just the flat ones, but all of them. And um, it's just a proposition now, which, I, which requires a bit of explanation that I won't give here, that one can obtain these by doing kind of cert forming certain homotopy fibers, twisted homotopy fibers of the, of the type of maps between these. So the statement is, first of all, it's possible in cohesive thought to axiomatize the mathematical concept of the Chan character. The Chan character is some measure of curvature of, uh, of gauge fields. It's the concept of Chan Bale theory. And, uh, and it's then possible to define these BG con types in cohesive thought as being modular types of what would sensibly be called Chan character twisted flat gauge fields. So this is the content of some some articles that I wrote, if you want to see the details, I have to uh, point you to those. And, um, and I'll just close this, this talk by, by stating that one of the, I think, really neat theorems or facts that you have then, that you may prove in cohesive homotopy type theory is that you have a, there's a differential version of, you know, to end with one actual sort of new insight. There's a differential version of the Brown representability theorem. So the, the traditional Brown representability theorem says that generalized cohomology theories, in the sense of Eilenberg Stainwood, cohomology theories like K theory or elliptic cohomology, that they're equivalent to spectra in the sense of stable homotopy types in homotopy theory. So there's a, these, these spectra are abelian versions of these types BG that we've seen here. And you would ask, you should ask, what does it mean to take such a generalized cohomology theory like K theory? and form a differential refinement for it, such as differential K-theory. The differential K-theory is the, is the space of fields in string theory, what's called the RR field. So these two appear as gauge fields in some hypothetical um, uh, theories of physics. And uh, so you would ask, what happens to the Brown representability theorem as you, as you add these, this connection structure, this gauge field structure? That used to be an open problem for a while, and uh, based on work by by some people in Regensburg around uh, Oli Bunker, they showed that in cohesive homotopy type theory, you can, you can show that, that the cohesive stable homotopy types have all the properties that you would demand of a differential generalized cohomology theory, so that you would take this as the defining equivalent. So this just as an article to, to see that something real can be done by taking the gauge principle from physics, combined with the locality principle from physics, interpreting it in the modern homotopy type theory and running with it. Just close by pointing you to some references that go into full detail of all the stuff that I glossed about. So there's a kind of lecture note review that I that is introductory. What and what for is high geometric quantization that exposes these things. There's the full details in this in the book that I wrote. There's this article with Mike Schulman where Mike uh, shows how to fully axiomatize this cohesion 
in Cork. And uh, in particular in that book, there's a section one too, I think this will be the topic of tomorrow's lecture actually, which, which walks in full detail through how to do all of classical field theory in terms of this cohesive axiomatics. That's it, thanks. Yeah, that's an excellent question. It has an excellent answer, luckily. I heard already a number of times about diffeology. It looks similar. It's yes, it's included in this as follows. So, thanks for the question. It's an excellent question. So, so if, we, if I like to write H for this collection of smooth sets. And, um, yeah, let's just talk about sets for the moment to make it easy. So, I talked about this shape modality. You know, I said on H, this is operation shape, which sends every, every H to its shape. This, this is an, a monad that really comes from an adjunction on this H that works as follows. So this H is a topos sitting over set with a global section functor and an inverse image. This inverse image has a further left adjoint. So I'll give it a name maybe right now. <laughs> and this has a further right adjoint. So, so the full axiomatics of this cohesion is actually that you have such an adjoint quadruple of functors extending the terminal geometric morphism, and induced from this is an adjoint triple of monads and co-monads on H. Right? These two give a monad, these two give a co-monad, these two give a monad. These are called shape, flat, and sharp. And this bit of this idea really just uh, written out. So there is this this monad, which is part of the system called sharp, coming from taking global sections and going back with its right adjoint. And here's now the answer to your question. If you have any x and h now, then this being a monad, there's a unit map to its sharp for x. So x is a diffeological space precisely if this is a monomorphism. Another way to say this is that the diffeological spaces are precisely the, the quasi-topos of sharp separated pre-sheaves here. A better way maybe to say it, if you have an arbitrary x which, where, where this is not a monomorphism, if you have any smooth space, like the smooth space of two forms or something, which is far from being concrete, and you have the image factorization, you can factor this unit through a Epimorphism followed by a monomorphism. Now this makes this universally a monomorphism, so this will be the, diff the concretification, the universal diffeological space underlying X. We call it even uh, epsilon. Maybe. So, so one, one way to write it is that the diffeological spaces form a sub-topos here, a sub-quasi-topos factoring this x variety. So, so the, the point is these smooth sets are more general than manifolds, they're more general than Frechet manifolds, they're also more general than diffeological spaces, but they contain all these categories faithfully. And the important thing is that, that, that precisely those objects that we need to form gauge fields are precisely not diffeological. If you think about, so, so just Maxwell theory, so there's a sheaf of two forms, say closed two forms, in H. So we may regard it as a smooth space, but Yoneda is such that if you have a manifold and are morphed into this smooth space of two forms, that's precisely the same thing as a two form. Or let's write F, precisely the same sense as the Faraday tensor. Set. But now this space is maximally non-concrete. It has no underlying set of points supporting it. If you do, if you do the sharpification of this, you get the point. So im epsilon of omega 2 closed is the point. So the underlying diffeological space of this is trivial, and yet this is a highly important and interesting space. In order to bring these gauge spaces, gauge theory spaces, into the game, we go to this full topos of all smooth sets, if you wish. In the 
infinity topos version, the, the, the spectra you have in mind are just the internal spectra to, to this category. When you say, when you say stable... Yes, exactly. I mean the... Type, yes. So... So... <coughs> right. That, that is exactly what connects to your, your theory of... So we could start with that of tangent topos. So we could start with that cohesive infinite topos, say of uh, infinity sex on smooth manifolds, and then form a tangent infinite topos of parametrized, parameterized, cohesive spectra, spectrum bundles over space in here. Of course, the fiber of this is kind of uh, this fiber would be the stabilization of H, the actual spectra of H. So the statement I had on the board in the previous slides as stated there would give would give that if you take these guys included in here, this is still a cohesive fin topos, then 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 maps into these represent differential generalized commodity theories. But actually, looking at this picture, something even better is true. You can why just include these? You can take a general guy in here, which is a base space X carrying carrying a spectrum bundle E. Let's call this base space something different. B. Let's do some brackets around it to indicate that it's a cohesive parameterized spectrum in here. And now you could take an ordinary, say, smooth manifold equipped with a zero spectrum bundle over it and ask for what is you know cohomology of X with coefficients in this bundle <coughs> formed in turn home. And as you know, I guess what this gives is this is the total twisted generalized differential ecomology. This gives a parameterized spectrum over the space of twists, B twists on X. And over it, it has a spectrum bundle whose fiber of a given twist is the, the twisted cohomology spectrum of the theory. Sure. So, so one even gets a statement that is a bit more general than this one gets that twisted differential generalized cohomology theories are the same as, how would you call them, cohesive tension types, right? So again, you would have faithfully characters. That, by the way, used to be, used to be a wide open problem in, a, in string theory. They knew to, to correctly model the RR fields. So the underlying incident sectors are in K theory. They knew that the actual fields are in differential K theory, and they knew that in the presence of what's called the B field, it had to be twisted K theory. But there was no working formalism that would tell one what, what the spectrum of B twisted differential K theory was. Mm -hmm. You know, it was kind of clear what one should do, but there was no formula. The Hopkins Singer formulation didn't apply to this setup. And, um, and this kind of solves this. I mean, there was also given an explicit construction again by, by Uli Bunker and Thomas Nicolas recently. But um, but if you if you take if you take E to be the smooth version of the KU spectrum for K theory, it's naturally parameterized over BGL one of KU about the twists of K theory, and that represents in the smooth tension infinity of those twisted differential K theory. So this answers, and this is how I got to these questions. This answers concrete open questions that people have for study, you know, mm -hmm. string theory, quantum field theory, where you ask about consistent string backgrounds for D brains in the presence of RR fields. There, despite you know all the years that people have been talking about this, there there were and are open mathematical problems as to what exactly that is, and such technology actually goes some way to to answering this. While at the same time being, I mean this is kind of a point I would like to make, but at the same time if you look at it from this logical perspective, there's this shortcut that lets you reason about these things. You know, without going through this full machine of the Hopkins Singer construction of differential commodity. I have a question, but just very basic. So, so when you define smooth sets or smooth 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 group, where you take the whole per sheet of the cement? Or yeah, the the top the category of all sheaves yeah. on the sheaves side. Of sheaves, yeah. Okay, so they are sheaves. Yeah, that's, so that's a, my question. That's a locality principle, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so what is the, so it's, it's just gluing together the patches, yeah? the, the sheaf 
Yeah, the chief condition. You said, I mean, at, at, at some point you need to prove that's my question. You resolve. I mean, that, that's the point. So you solve a moduli problem. Mm -hmm. So you have to solve it. It's not completely obvious. So the fact that I'm working with actual sheaves and stacks means that you know, if I write BG con and then say that a map into it is a gauge field, then it really means the space of maps it is gives the full space of correct gauge fields, seeing all the topologically non-trivial inside and sectors. Instead of, if you took this just to be the pre-sheaf of, you know, the pre-sheaf of, the naive pre-sheaf, you would just get the topologically trivial one. So the sheaf condition is, yeah, I build it right in, I mean, we're talking topos anyway, but it's built in and, and it has this physical relevance. No, because when you uh, introduce this notion of uh, uh, smooth sets, mm -hmm. you just said, I, I look at So, yeah, it's sheaf, right? Uh, maybe I should have said more clearly. So, the, okay, the category okay. smooth sets is a category called sheaf. So. Right. Well, that's what's just my question. I mean, you put the, you know, the point of this is that, that you, no, can, change, you can change your site if, you, if it, you can change your site. And maybe there are lots of sites whose topos are cohesive and hence. There are lots of exotic geometries in which all this theory also goes through, as also interpretation. In particular, there's this very exotic choice. You might take sites like smooth manifolds and equip them with the trivial Grodnik topology, such that the sheaves are just pre sheaves. I think that will still be cohesive because they have a terminal. Well, yeah, no, I'm not sure. Is it? Well, I think actually it is, yeah. So you will get a cohesive theory which will, however, be very exotic geometry. But that's a good point, maybe. So this whole axiomatics in the end proves statements that are hold true not just in the smooth context. They hold true for instance in the complex analytic context, in the context of supergeometry, in this tangent context, also in the context of, um, of spectral E infinity geometry. One has to work a bit there, but also derived. One way, I mean, one way to think about it is that you are taking a site with some algebraic structure on it, you know, and that's what you use. So you know, like in the obvious theory. Well, I haven't. Well, one could do that too. It's useful to build some models, but I haven't actually used that, right? Lovier theories. No, no, I don't mean Lovier. I mean Lovier theory as such. But I mean, you have some operations you want to apply on your on your objects, and these operations come from the basis from the site you choose. I mean. You want typically to apply smooth, smooth maps, and so you pick them in your in your basis. You know how? I mean, the question is how how how, how much of what you're doing is dependent on the site. Yes, that's yeah, that's the whole point. Nothing, right? So I want. Well, well, I mean, as long as I'm. So this is the point of this quiz. Actually, we see that lots of toposes they may be defined as being sheaves or infinity sheaves on some side. And then we may ask, so in which of these, for which sort of site do we have a good notion of differential geometry and differential cohomology then? And this is a, so in, one answer is, well, as soon as this topos exhibits cohesion and that its dominant geometric morphism is extra adjoins, as soon as that is the case, we can axiomatically build all ingredients of modern differential geometry inside here and hence get you know, notions of all of them for whatever site makes that true. But you're of course right that, you know, but can you do some reverse engineering and understand what are the kind of properties you need at the site? No, I don't know it completely. This would be a question for some other experts in the room, maybe. So I know I, I you know, I have this notion of an in, what I call an infinity cohesive site. I have some sufficient condition on a site such that that's how I build these models that I that I know that Thomas is cohesive. Yeah, but this would be possible. Yeah, you would be the expert too. Yeah, yeah, I, I worked specifically on reversing. <laughs> I mean, for example, local connectedness, I have already characterized uh, in, uh, in a reverse way. So, I mean, cohesive is more than that, so one should work on that. Mm -hmm. But I haven't done it, but I think it's, uh, it's possible. Okay. okay. Of course, the, the important point here would be we, one really needs this for, for the stacks, for the conditions yeah. a bit, condition for the extra left to is much stronger. So, but it would be excellent if we. I, we thought a bit about it. But my experience is that uh, the 
That would be, that would be nice, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, but uh, I mean, you can take uh, pages of calculations, and so it's not necessary to Yeah, but like, I mean, what kind of uh, description do you have? I mean, in the end, what kind of... You well, know? you have some... Some elementary properties of the sites. So something involving just uh, the category and the topology, sieves, uh, J-clouds, the sieves, mm -hmm. these kind of things. Okay. So if you want to have a look, uh, you can take my paper. Um, and in fact, we were discussing, uh, I, I now remember. So yes, on the forum, yeah. That on, <laughs> on the end forum. So it's, uh, it's called um, uh, Site Characterizations for Geometric Invariance of Toposes. So in this paper, I gave various general tools to deal with these kind of questions. Of course, the cohesive condition appears to be uh, more uh, more difficult than uh, the examples I treated in the paper, but still, I mean, so strong. I'm not claiming that just by applying the methods of the paper, you can get the result in a straightforward <laughs> way. But still, I mean, I'm talking more in general about uh, making the sum readings, and uh, often uh, it is the case you can do that. Uh, Sometimes you have uh, general methods that allow you to... Yeah, but, I, 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 I'm sorry, but my question was really, do you, do you have some geometric you know, insight from, from this kind of criteria? So for instance, can you, you know, I mean, I yeah, understand yeah, that. Yeah, you, you really so, get some, uh, so some elementary, easy to, to understand properties of the site. Okay. Yeah, but it's not way of thinking in gauge fields provide a reinterpretation of the Kiger BRST homology groups? Well, yeah, I sort of believe, yeah. I mean, first of all, one, maybe to answer this question, is, so, so one can take, so suppose you have a space, so what's the BRST complex? If you have a space time x, you can form, you form this, Kind of this, this mapping stack into into the moduli of, of the connections, and you want, want to say that this is the moduli of gauge fields on X. But this is not quite correct, actually, due to the context. <coughs> this needs to be this connects to uh, the question about um, diffeological spaces. This needs to be concretified. This moduli stack is not concrete. So there's a, there's a if you yeah, it's a bit taking it. Choosing a, choosing a Hodge filtration on G connections with such a choice, there's a way to concretify this. I'm just saying there's some way to build this internally. So this is the stack that one would call maybe G bundles with connections on X. And, um, and uh, with a few more axioms for to bring differentiation into the game, this 
modular stack may be differentiated to a Lie algebroid. And that is what the BRST complex is. The BRST complex is a Chevrolet Allenbach algebra of that Lie algebroid. So it's the, in a way, the Lie algebra, the infinitesimal version corresponding to this thing. So the cohomology of the cohomology of the BRST complex is a shadow of the homotopy groups of the full moduli stack of gauge fields. So this recovers, for instance, the lowest, the lowest group is statement. Pi zero of this is just equivalence class of gauge fields, which recovers the fact that the degree zero cohomology of the BRC complex is just a gauge invariant function, right? So the BRC complex is, maybe I should write a dual or something, right? It's the functions on the Lie algebra of this kind. And so forth, right? So, so it, in this sense, it has this interpretation, but I think you're maybe asking for something more concrete. I'm not sure if I have a good answer to this. Maybe you want to know why exactly do people say that the second cohomology here knows the anomalies or something like this? And yeah. this is a, I don't know if this has a good, I'm not, yeah, I think this is a bit, I don't want to say any answer to this right now. <laughs> Let me just state this here. Thank you. Final question. So we can thank our speaker. Thank you.